you got your Bibles, open the book of Genesis. We're rushing through the book. If you miss, you'll probably be behind quite a bit. We're in Genesis 1, 6 through 8. We've got one more lesson on what's called the second day. We're on the second day. Then, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Remember, the waters covered the earth. An expanse is going to separate the waters of Genesis 1-2. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse and which were above the expanse, and so it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning, a second day. Now, last time, we talked about the waters. We talked about the second day waters. And what God did is he put an expanse in the middle of that water. He put an expanse that goes around the world. You know, planet. when I say the world, I'm talking about planet, planet Earth. It was water. Then he put expanse which separated the waters. You understand that? You got that picture in mind? And he called that division of the waters, he called it the expanse. When he put that expanse in there, from the expanse, from the expanse to the earth, we call that the first heaven and atmosphere. That's where the birds fly in the airplanes. Above that expanse is what we call outer space today. And above that is the third heaven where God dwells. You got that picture in your mind? That's really important. What he did on the second day is he took that water that was wrapped around the earth in Genesis 1-2, and he put an expanse in the middle of that water, which separated the waters from above the expanse and below the earth. Day two is the only day other than the seventh day that God didn't say what he created was good. When you get home this week, when you get home this day, it won't take you a week to get home, I guess. But sometime during your study time, go ahead and look at the creation days, and you'll see that in day two and on day seven, God did not say it was good. Now, we know why he didn't on day seven, because creation was completed. But why didn't he say it on day two? See, when I read that, you, I didn't call your attention to it, but it's not there. I read six, seven, and eight, and it's not in your Bible. Okay? It's not there. And it's not on day seven, but we know why it's not on day seven. But why isn't it on day two? Because, listen to me now, this is really important, because the water above the expanse and the water below the expanse, i.e. earth, is going to cause the great flood in Noah's day of the earth. And when you read the seventh chapter of Genesis, you know, Genesis 6 through 9 chapters, 6 through 9th chapter talks about Noah's days and the flood. And the water that's going to be used is the water above and the water below is going to cause this great flood of the earth. Peter talks about it in 2 Peter 3rd chapter when he's talking on eschatology, the study of the second coming. He talks about the world was once covered with water and, and separated into waters. <laughs> And that generation, Noah's generation, was flooded and drowned with, except for eight people on that ark. So day two is God establishing a divine judgment 
of an entire civilization one day to come. From Adam, the Garden of Eden, to Noah is ten generations. And it shows you the long-suffering and patience of God that none would perish, but all would come to salvation. Hmm? So why are you here today? I mean, why are you here? Why have you come to visit the ark? I can tell you why. If you're not saved, you need to be saved because one day Christ is going to return and those in Christ will, will leave this earth. It's called the rapture. And those who aren't will be left to go through a terrible tribulational time. That's one reason you've come to visit the ark today. The other reason is to learn the word of God. The only book you're going to have in heaven is going to be the Bible. Any book from earth. The only book in the library in heaven is going to be the Bible. Now, it'd be an expanded version, apparently, because we're going to set it at the feet of God Almighty who wrote it, and this is just a little bit of the story. But I tell you, the greatest thing that happened to my life after being saved was falling in love with the Word of God. Let me tell you why. Because you're told to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You're told to walk. If you, if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, that's the gospel. If you believe that, the gospel is the power of God to save you. Now what? Now you're to walk by faith and not by sight. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So either you've come to visit the ark today that one day is going to float away in what's called the rapture, either to, be a, to get on the ark through faith in Christ or to fall in love with the word of God. To fall in love with the word of God that's going to carry you in your walk through your generation to have a great ministry for Christ. So let's pray. And we'll do our study. If you're here today and you've never believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've heard it but never believed it. There are very few people in Moody that have not heard it, I suppose. But do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe you're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself it is a gift? Do you really believe that? You really do have to believe that. That's what saves you. And the Holy Spirit dwells in your, inside your life, your body, so that you can fall in love with the Word of God. You need to have that prayer. You need to let the Holy Spirit teach you wonderful truths out of the Word of God today. He can't do it if there's personal sin in your life as a believer. Mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue and overt sins, and he gives you a very simple solution from the cross. If you will confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Cleanse you. That brings you back into fellowship with God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way, both by the automobile and the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. For God so loved the world, that love has been put within us, Romans 5, 5, at the point of salvation. And we ought to love you back. We ought to love you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our mind. And we ought to do it all the time. And we ought to love one another as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. 
May we be those people to our generation and our family, the people of our community of Moody and St. Clair County. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, resolving the chaotic water problem in day two requires the second day and the third day. So you'll want to pay attention to the second and third day on resolving the water problem of Genesis 1-2. Today I want to look at five things about the second day and the idea of the expanse. Point number one, on the second day, God made, it's the word asa in the Hebrew. It's a cow perfect. He made the expanse, a rakia. I explained the, the expanse to you. It's sometimes referred to as the firmament. The firmament is referred to as a canopy and as an expanse. Now listen to me, this is important. When it's called the expanse, like it is in the New American Standard and other English translations, it's referring to fixed spaces. And I tried to explain that to you. I said that an expanse is put around the earth to separate the waters. Waters above and waters below. We know what they were going to be later used for. That's why it doesn't say, and it was good. All right. What happened when he put the exp ex expanse in, it had a fixed space underneath the expanse and a fixed space above it. The fixed space below it we call atmosphere, and the fixed space above it we call outer space today on planet Earth. I told you last time that this expanse, when you go through it, astronaut, astronauts as well as humans that have traveled in outer space, civilians, they know when they go through it. They call it the thin blue line. You, For you and I, when we go through it in the rapture, we'll call it the expanse. That's kind of interesting because you go through fixed spaces. You go from one through the blue thin line called the expanse into another fixed space. That is the Hebrew word, rakia, for the, for the word expanse. I wrote it on your paper so that you might understand it better. Now, here's something also interesting. The average, per, first of all, in your English, you're not going to see it. But in the Hebrew, it is very obvious it's the direct object. In the Hebrew... It's kind of interesting, I can't write it for you today, but it's interesting in the way it's written. It's got an X and then a, looks like an H with a foot. And three little dots under the X. And it's E-T-H, F. In the Hebrew, when you have a direct object attached to a word of vocabulary, right? We're learning vocabulary. God is teaching vocabulary on every day, right? And by the way, we still use it. <laughs> people, you know, people, I don't believe in God, but he uses his, his, uses his vocabulary. <laughs> and I, I mean, why, how do, why do we call it day one, day two? Why do we have seven, you know? Man didn't come up with it. God came up with it. Man, man, and he taught him vocabulary, and we still use it. And I get the, the, I love talking to atheists. Yeah, they never talk to anybody who understands God, apparently. They wouldn't be one. They'd be stupid, but they wouldn't be an atheist. So the direct object, I put it on your paper, because the direct object, F, E-T-H, was used with expanse, listen to me, just like the light of day one. And what a direct object does, it's a pointer. 
It's directing you. It's called a direct object. And it's a pointer. It emphasizes something really big, and don't miss this. <laughs> Light of day one, expansive day two is big, big, big. And it, to do it in the Hebrew, they put a marker. They put a direct object. And they did here, and that's wonderful. The direct object places as a pointer the emphasis on the importance of the expanse for habitation of the world. You remember in verse 2, the earth was not able to be inhabited. Isaiah 45, 18. So God made the expanse out of something. Asa, the word made, means to make something out of something. The only thing that we have something to make something out of is light. Day one, right? Nothing else has been... And the Bible says that that expanse, when you look at it from either side of the fixed space, it has a, a brightness like crystal, like light shining on crystal. It glitters. And, and, and people see that when they go through it. Well, look for it. You too will one day go to outer space and into the third heaven when you die to be absent from bodies present Lord. That's what he's talking about. Remember when you go through, pay attention to that little thin blue line that will look like shining crystal. It will have a glittering to it. And you will go like, you know, you'll say bye-bye to one group and hi to another. And it will be an amazing trip for you. I hope you look forward to it. So, Asa, point number two. Remember that the expanse was a fixed space like a canopy or a thermal blanket in the antediluvian period. If I say antediluvian, what do I mean? Before the flood. What we refer to the civil, and that was an entire civilization of ten generations. What we call the civilization after the flood that you and I live in, is called the post-Diluvian civilization. There are, one, two, three, there are three civilizations in the Bible. Anti-Diluvian, the post-Diluvian, and the millennial civilization. That thousand-year reign with Christ. Okay. Now, in the anti-Diluvian period, Prior to Adam, right? Prior to Adam. We're in day one. Adam's in day two. Prior to Adam, God put the expanse over it, and it acted like a thermal blanket for a greenhouse concept. I wrote this on your paper. Remember, the expanse was a fixed space like a canopy or a thermal blanket over the earth. Isaiah 40, 22, Isaiah 45, 12, and 18. During this period of time, there was no rain on the earth, only mist. Now, you'll learn that as we, as we study on further into the book of Genesis. Okay? Okay. Listen to Isaiah 40, 22. He, God, who sets above the circle of the earth. You know where that, you know what holds that circle in the place? Is the expanse. God, who sets above the circle of the expanse of the earth, the, the circle of the earth and its inhabitants, are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. See, he's talking the atmosphere. We call it atmosphere. He's talking, but it's. It's antediluvian atmosphere. It's going to last 10 generations. Write this down. 
Write this down. It's going to last 10 generations. It's going to go from Adam to Noah, right down Genesis 5, where it talks about the 10 generations and list them. And then you want to write down Luke 3, 23 through 38, where he's going to list them again, and he's going to run them all the way from Adam to Christ. Write this down. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. That says Adam of Genesis was the first Adam, and Jesus Christ was the last Adam of human history. Well, things we should know. In this period of time, the antediluvian period, it had the earth had humidity due to mist with uniform temperature. You've ever had that, been to that place? We get it once or twice a year where you just go like, oh, wow, this is so good. I could, I could, this is the weather I would like for the whole year. Then you move to that state, you find out that they have different weather patterns and that's not as good as you thought it was. I had a friend that was in Raleigh with a tobacco company, very successful. His dream deal was to make enough money to retire and go to Florida. And he did. Made bucuts of money. Moved to Florida, found a place, built the house of their dreams, and hated Florida. <laughs> He had, they had visited in prime time, I don't know, for, you know, three or four days or a week, and went like, you know, I could, I could do this. And, and so before he got to retire, they traveled to different places, and he thought, you know, I could do this. Then he got down there, and there was bugs, and there was this, and there was that, and he went like, I hate it. You couldn't have said that if you lived in, in this period of time. Well, you probably could have, but you know, I don't know if you can please everybody all the time or whatever, whatever, how that goes. The result of this canopy or thermal blanket is global, a global greenhouse atmosphere upon the earth. The writer Psalms grasped an idea of that in Psalms 104, 2 and 3 when he said, covering yourself with light as a cloak stretching out heaven like a tent, talking about God, at like a tent curtain, he lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters and he walks upon the winds, the, the wings of the wind. <laughs> That's some poetry right there, isn't it? I, I love poetry you can see in your mind. I love that poetry that you see in your mind. I go, I can just picture that. I just picture my eye like, wouldn't that be fun? Huh? I'd be the roller coasters that no matter how high they go. And that's pretty good. Point number three. The second day expanse resulted in a perfect environment for the inhabitants of the earth. That would be Adam and Eve all the way to Noah. Lasted, listen, lasted from Adam all the way to the 600th year in the life of Noah, and that it all changed. You can read about it in Genesis 2, 8 through 25. We'll be there sometime next year. They were perfect, listen to me, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. They were perfect humans. No, no Adam's sin and no sin nature. I mean, that's like heaven, isn't it? Yet, listen to me, dear hearts, yet they found it difficult to spiritually grasp the doctrine of God's grace in a perfect state of existence. How about that? Oh, you say, oh, my life would be so much better if I had a different job. My life would be so much better if I had a different mate. My life would be so much better if my kids would behave. My life would, your life would be better if it's just like it is now, it's bitter. 
Your life is better in God. No matter what he, what he brings your way, you salute and say, I'd rather be with God alone than have all the riches and all the bl blessings the world could give me. The world can't give you any blessings. They don't expect five back. They give you one gift. The devil wants five back. And he'll how do you tell he gets it? My, 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 don't follow him. The second day expanse resulted in perfect environment for the, 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 for, for the habitation as well as the inhabitation of the earth. When we get to the sixth day, when we get to the sixth day, when we get to the sixth day, earth is ready for man. When we get to the sixth day, earth is ready for man. It took, it took five days for God in his magnificent grace to set a perfect environment up for man. All right? He still works that in your life. Not environment but the space in which you live. Eh? You're not going to have a perfect environment. Well, that, that day is gone. You, you won't see that day again until the millennium. You get to the millennium, you're going to see a, a whole different ball game out there uh, environmentally. Right? And here's the issue. You want to be an environmentalist? Take care of your own space. Stop complaining about other people. Just take care of your own space. You'll be a good environmentalist. Because environment's going to be in the environment. You can't change the environment. Listen. Eh, it don't matter. It's just a trip down to nonsense, so I'm not going to talk about it. Adam and Eve will live in a place of perfect environment called the Garden of Eden. They were perfect humans. The expanse produced perfect environment, but couldn't keep a perfect Adam and Eve from volitionally sin against God. They didn't have a sin nature. They weren't under Adamic sin. They had everything. You know, they had the. They were drinking out of the golden shoe. You know, eating the eggs from the golden goose. You know, and sinned against God. Think about that. What did they hope to get better than what God had gave them? I don't know. Write a book on it because you got that life today. You, see, you think that your life could be better if, 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 if you could just have this or that or this and that. Listen, you got everything to make your life happy right now, right in the state it is, no matter what you're going through. When you understand that, God will, God will help you where you are. And he'll help you to be happy with what you have. Can I coach you a little bit today? You need to be content with where you are. Because then God can move you to places that you would have never been content. You've got to learn to be content. You've got to learn that contentment is in God. It's not in things. It's not in the details of life. It's in, it's not in people, it's not in things, it's not in money, it's not in this, it's not in that. Listen, it's God or mammon. I, details of life is mammon. There's no hope for you for happiness in mam. It's in God. You have read the difference between God and mammon, haven't you, in Matthew? If not, read it. How do you say, I don't know where to find it? Yes, you do. You go to the back of your Bible and a thing called concordance and look up the word mammon and hunt it down. You might ask, how was it possible for Adam and Eve to have everything in a perfect environment as perfect people, perfect environment, everything is perfect. How was it possible that these two people would sin against God? Volition. 
You know what volition is? It's free will of choice. And can you see it any clearer than in the garden? God made man with volition, the freedom to choose. That's why you have to choose to be saved. God brings it to your plate and says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. You either accept it or you don't. That's volition. That is volition, dear hearts. You might ask, how is it possible for Adam and Eve to give up all of that? Because they were told, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the day you eat, die, and you will die. It is possible because ahead of their fall was the fall of Satan. You see, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 is the fall of Satan. That's why the earth became chaotic. I gave you a great study out of Revelation, the 12th chapter. That whole 12th chapter explained that to you. You know who got him in the garden in the perfect environment? In a perfect state of existence? You know who got him? Well, you ought to, you ought to read the third chapter of Genesis. We will get there. The serpent in the garden that was called Satan. Got him. And he got him by volition. Make sure he don't get you, because he, he can't get you any other way but volition. Perfect people in a perfect environment. Listen to me now. Perfect people in perfect environment without faith in a perfect will of God is no match in the angelic conflict. Oh, you'll learn that when we get to chapter 3. Point number four, a new phrase. I know you people don't study to, to learn, but you should, you should begin to study your Bible to learn. Don't skip words that you don't know. Stop and ask the Holy Spirit to interpret them to you. A new phrase is introduced to second day. Now listen to me. Here's what happens. You read it. You don't know what it means, so you pass it over. You shouldn't pass it over. You should write it down bring it to me. Bring it to Al. Bring it to somebody who knows the answer to this stuff. Here it is. Watch this. A new phrase is introduced on the second day, and it reads, and it was so. The Hebrew, the it was so, is the Hebrew word hayah, and it's a kel imperfect. I wrote down your paper. Haya is the equivalent to Aimi in the Greek. Aimi is the word is or was. It's called an absolute status quo verb of existence. Descartes, the philosopher, said, I think, therefore I am. Ta da! As self consciousness. Self consciousness is important to God consciousness. It's part of your soul. Self consciousness, conscience, mentality, volition, and emotion is your soul makeup. And it was so. Now watch this. And it was so. Right? We got anybody around on day two? Is there any humans around or anybody around? Mm -hmm. Got nobody around. We've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit engaged in creational issues. You right? So who's he talking to and what's that mean? And so it was. Now, if you stop to think about that little phrase, it's a reference to something that has already been decreed that has been resolved. And so it was. 
mean, they write children books this way. Once upon a time. Da -da 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 -da. And so it was. Do you get that? You got to have a story. There's got to be something ahead of that, right? And so it was. So it was what? Don't you ask yourself questions like that? See, that, that keeps me up at night. So it was what? Who's it? What's this about? And so it was. So it was what? Takes you, listen to me now, it takes you back to Eternal Life Conference when God laid out the whole wonderful plan of God in eternity past. I did a study with you on what was called the Eternal Life Conference where we ever got into the book of Genesis. It was necessary for you to know that. Because he laid out this whole deal in eternity past, and now day one is done. At the end of day two, we've got this whole thing with the water problem resolved, which has to do with the antediluvian civilization flood. And he says, and so it was. And, and, and so, and it was so. And it was so. That's why it's there. Here's the moral of the story to your life. God has already set in stone your life. Your job is to walk it out by faith. Not one thing is going to pass your life, good, bad, or ugly, that he hasn't signed off on. And it is to your benefit. Listen to me. Either Romans 8.28 works or it doesn't. All things work together for good. That's a mental attitude. And so... And it was so. It's the way I close my day, my life every day. I close my day down every day with the Lord with that phrase. I say to him, <laughs> I tell him all the things that I just went through that day. Good, bad, and ugly. I say, I want to thank you because I know it was so. I know that nothing passed through my life today that wasn't according to the plan of God. And I've tried to walk it out the best I know by the will of God. And I closed my day down, and it was so. Because I'm looking forward to day three. I'm looking forward to tomorrow to see what God has brought to my life to walk it out by faith. Thrilled with the opportunity, whether it's whether I consider or others consider good, bad, or ugly, I must always bring myself to know it is always what? Good, bad, or ugly, it's always what? Good. It's always good. Your mind might say, This is a bad day. What do you say? What do you say when your mind says, well, this has been a bad day? <laughs> Once in a while we get them, don't we? You got your day planned. You get caught talking. You walk out. And your car won't start. And now you're on the phone disconnecting appointments that take you up to about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Right? It's hot. There are a lot of things you say to yourself. One of the things you must say to yourself, it is good. Apparently, God wanted me to clear my schedule. Apparently, God wanted me to sit down a moment and listen to him while he talks to me. When you, see, he'll do that when you get through talking to yourself. <laughs> And you know, you don't have to be riding home in a wonderful air-conditioned car to know that it's good. You can be sitting in the heat. 
And once you get through making all your calls and <laughs> reestablishing your life up for the day, you just calm down and say, listen, this is good. Bring me to understand how this is good. Bring, bring me to a place in my life that I can understand that this is good. And before the day is over, he will bring you to a place where you say, and it was so. <laughs> and you can actually sleep that night. All right, at least I can. And it was so. It's a reference back to the Eternal Life Conference where all this was laid out is now coming to pass. It is all part of the origin of the plan of God in eternity being worked out in time. This phrase, and it was so, watch me now. Watch me now, because you don't read the Bible to learn. You just read the Bible to get check marks, I guess. Listen, when you study the six days, now listen to me. When you read the six days, this phrase is not used on day one, day five, and day seven. You should ask yourself, why, why isn't it used? Right? Would that be a fair question? All right. It was used on day two. On day three, it's used twice. Uh, it's used on day four. It's used on day six twice. See, it's little things like these in your life that you are reminded, no matter what's going on in your life, that God is in charge. Let him be in charge. Let him be in charge. Because he will show you great and powerful and powerful ideas of your life that will come out of wherever you are. He'll bring new people to your life. When you wind up in a doctor's office and he says, I don't know why you're here. When I hear those words, I go like, it could be, it's not possible this could be an accident. I'm where I'm always supposed to be. You can look in a doctor's eyes and you can say to him, listen to me, God sent me here to you. I didn't, I didn't come for you to minister to me. I came to minister to you. You need to be honest with me. You got something going on either in your private light or your practice that needs to be addressed by God Almighty or I wouldn't be here, you saying, I don't know why you're here. You're a perfect... You understand that? If I'm not here for that, why am I here? Oh, I'm here for, I'm here for ministry, not medicine. And sure enough, I was. Sure enough, who would have guessed? Who would have? Oh, I guess that was just an accident. All right. So when you run across these little things or studying something like this, you need to pay attention to them. When I get to these places, I'm going to call, it, call your attention back to it. In closing, there is another special phrase used in creation that needs our attention. It is the phrase, and it was good. This special phrase is used every day with the exception of the second and the seventh. And I explained why. Agreed? The seventh day, because it's completed, right? The second day, because it's the flood coming of discipline divine discipline on an entire civilization. Agree? Well, I, I'm, I'm in chapter 6, 7, 8, 9 when I tell you that. Okay? Listen to this, and I close. The flood, the, it's a, in the 600th year, showing the perfect plan of God, in the 600th year of Noah's life, who's keeping count? God. See, you can lie about your age to everybody but God. Right? I mean, he's got you. I mean, who's counting? You think God's counting your birthdays? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
in the 600th year of Noah's life, <laughs> in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, how about that? I mean, God could put it down into minutes and seconds. We probably couldn't grasp it. 600th year, the second month, and the 17th day. Who's running a calendar in your life? God. On the same day of that month, all the fountains of the deep, deep burst open, that's the water below, and the floodgates of the skies were open, that was the water above. And we have a worldwide flood. All right? Let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. We'll take a 15-minute break, and we'll come back to the second service. Let us pray. Well, our Father, we are so thankful for you and your love and mercy and grace to us. We, we, do, we come with thankful hearts today. We come with thankful hearts. I'm so excited to be in Moody. Thank you, Father, to put me into Moody with this church in St. Clair County. I hope we will be a, a teaching church for the people that desire to know the Word of God and that want to have great ministry to their city, their county, and their state as far as to the uttermost parts of the earth. I thank you, Father, for this offering today. May we be wise stewards to spend a little on ourselves and a lot on reaching people for Christ. Bless us and encourage our hearts, Father, with all of the wonderful things you give us. We are appreciative of, of it all. No matter how it's interpreted in our life, it is good. In Jesus' name, amen.